Welcome to our evening service here at Dunseverick Baptist Church. We really appreciate you joining us from your own homes this evening. Thank you so much for watching this service. Friends, at this time we're going to unite our hearts in prayer, after which we'll sing our opening hymn. Let us unite in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for each person who has joined us tonight. And we pray, O oh Lord, that hearts would be blessed. Lord Jesus, that as the gospel message goes forth, and we hear a testimony as well as the word of God, so that you would bless us, Lord, that you would keep us, Lord. Lord, we pray for people's salvation tonight. If they don't know you as their own and personal saviour, that they'll trust in Jesus. Lord Jesus, we pray for safety of people as well, that you protect us, whether from coronavirus, from cancer, or other ailments that are out there. Lord Jesus, put your hand upon us. Bless this meeting tonight. In the Saviour's name, Amen. Let us now unite together in worship. And we're all going to sing a lovely hymn. It's 594 in the Songs of Victory for our own folk in Dunseverick. If you're using that in your living room or your kitchen. It's love divine, all love's excelling. Let's now praise the name of the Lord. for that good singing. We now want to deal with the announcements and they'll be brief. Again, as legislation evolves both from Westminster and also here at Stormont, we just keep our ears to the ground to see if it's possible to hold a gathering 
whether that would be in our church car park for a drive-in service. I think that will probably come before we can gather in the church in any formal way. So continue to pray for that issue and for that need. Continue to pray for those of our fellowship here at Dunseverick. And please do phone one another, encourage one another, text one another. And I want to thank all those who contribute to the Thought for the Day that's up on our Facebook page each day. And as well those who send wee words of encouragement to me and to others. Whether it's for the Facebook page and the ministry there, the weekdays or the Lord's Day. And also for the Telephone Devotional Line Ministry. Thank you very much for all your warm words of encouragement. Friends, with regards our own church then, do remember on Tuesday night... On Facebook, 8pm, it'll be the fourth and final one in our series, Jesus is Coming. And we're going to be looking at heaven. Have you ever thought what heaven's going to be like? Well, I hope from the word of God to be able to share that with you this Tuesday evening at 8pm and then for a time of prayer. Also, on Wednesday night, ladies, are you listening? Normally in the month of May, you have your Walk for Life outreach not true. I know that we still can go out once a day and maybe by the time I finish this message Boris will have increased that to any number of times per day that we can go out for a walk but that's just with our immediate family. We cannot gather together as a group and do exercise or go out and do an outreach but friends we're going to continue with our walk for life outreach. Because normally there is an invited guest and they share their testimony and we share some fellowship and food together. Well, that's going to happen on Wednesday night. And you're going to meet the Barr family from Lurgan. And you will hear about their work in Uganda principally, but also in South America, where they run a Christian charity called Charlene's Project. We'll hear much more about that on Wednesday night. And you join us at 8pm and be blessed. So again we thank you for joining us tonight. And now it's over to her sister Avril. Avril Neely is a dear sister in the Lord here in her fellowship in Dunseverick. And Avril I thank you for being willing to share in her Sunday evening gospel meeting. Over to you now Avril. May the Lord bless you. testimony to you. I hope that what I'm going to say will be an encouragement to you. I hope you'll find it helpful and that it'll be a blessing. As I said earlier, I'm Avril. Um, I don't have a Balamani accent, so you can work out I was born in Tyrone. I grew up in a family where my parents were very much upright, good, very good people, very very involved in church and I think they always felt in their lives that if you did your best and you give your best that that was always enough and that was always all that God needed to get them into heaven. Fortunately in 1970 they attended a mission and there they heard a very clean and simple message of salvation and that, that salvation was based on just acknowledging that we are sinners. God says in his word that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet mum and dad thought that if they did all they could, that was going to be enough. And yet we come back to God's word again. And he says, you know, all your righteousnesses are just like filthy rags. And what he really means is it doesn't matter how much you try to do, it's nothing. He'll just cast it aside. And I'm so glad that Mummy and Daddy heard that message because during that mission, they both realised that they needed to give their lives over to God. They needed to acknowledge that they needed to be saved. And they got saved and gave their lives over to the Lord at that time. And then when I was about 13, I responded in exactly the same way. I heard the message that Jesus had died for me on the cross 
he paid the ultimate sacrifice and that was all I needed to do. I didn't need to keep trying every day to be the best I could. I didn't need to keep giving into my church and giving of my time to good works. All I needed to do that morning was ask God to come into my heart. I told him I was so sorry that I had sinned and I just wanted him so much to be a part of my life. And I went home that day from church knowing that no matter what happened now, I had assurance of heaven. And nothing else can give you that assurance, only knowing that he's your saviour is the only thing. I suppose going on through life then and doing nursing and getting married and having children, I suppose I really would have been under the impression that life had been so good to me and maybe that was the way it was for God's children. But in 2001, we had a difficult six months. I had a diagnosis of cancer, thankfully an early diagnosis. After recovering from that, I lost a lovely little nephew of nine to a brain tumour. And just two months after he died, my husband Paul was diagnosed at 40 years old with bowel cancer and it was a terminal uh, diagnosis. And we had him for another 13 months before God called him home. Yes, I can't sit here and say that being a Christian made it all okay. And it took away the fear and the, the bitterness and the grieving, it didn't. But the one thing I can say is that knowing in my heart that God was with me every moment of that journey made all the difference. It was just knowing that he loved me and that he cared for me, because that's what he does for his children. And he gave me peace in my heart that nothing else could have given me. And I know that that peace was found through acceptance of this was God's will for my life and that was something I had to accept and it was really really hard but you know God has proved himself to be so faithful he's been by my side through all of those journeys and he does tell us that he will never leave us and he'll never forsake us and even the psalmist says yea though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death but we're to fear no evil for he is with us and that is so true and you'll never find that peace in the world you'll never find it in a church you'll only find it in knowing Christ as your saviour and I just hope tonight that wherever you are we are living in difficult times at the moment everybody is frightened they're frightened of coronavirus you just don't know what a day is going to bring but I just pray tonight that you'll just simply ask the Lord to save you and to forgive you and you'll ask him into your heart and into your life and that this will be the start of a new journey for you. God bless and thank you for listening. Thank you Avril, that was tremendous. Real evidence sir of God's saving grace and God's sustaining grace and maybe you have been touched by Avril's testimony tonight and you need her saviour. I pray that you will call upon the name of the Lord to save your life. Thank you again, Avril. We turn now to the word of the Lord for our evening message. It's fine in Luke's gospel. We've been going through the parables this past few Sunday nights and we continue on in that series. And it's Luke chapter 16. And it's a well-known parable beginning to read at verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he left up his eyes, being in torments, and saith Abram afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and cried and said, Father Abram, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abram said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. 
Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. This evening, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson is speaking to the nation about the government's exit strategy to get out of the corona pandemic lockdown. And if we hear is true, well, tomorrow you'll be able to go to the gardening centre and indeed you'll be able to exercise as often as you want. It's part one of a five-part strategy that may well indeed extend through to the autumn. Our great interest, of course, as a local church gathering and fellowship is when can we return to church for us? So please, we pray that that would be sooner rather than later. Friends, as I think about Boris's exit strategy, I think here in this text of this man's exit strategy. Friends, we read three things about the man in this parable that the Lord told us about. Firstly, we read of his grand opulence. Well, verse 19 reminds us something about him. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and furred sumptuously every day. What can we say about him? Well, we can say something about his dress sense, can't we? There, he was clothed in purple. He liked his fashion, so he did his designer clothes. How do we know that? Well, if you remember when the Lord Jesus was sentenced by Pontius Pilate, and the scourging process began. The soldiers mocked him. And they placed upon him, as well as the crown of thorns, a purple cloak. Do you remember that? And then they bowed down before him, mockingly saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Friends, purple was a royal colour. And it denoted there a material that was very rich. And so we see firstly here this man's dress sense. But I tell you something else. There wasn't only something written about his fashion. But what about his food? It says in verse 19. He fared sumptuously. And it says every day. That was the dining scene. Oh friends. He wasn't only a fashion guru. But he was a food connoisseur. No doubt. There, If Master Chef had been on in that era. He would have been one of those invited in to sit down and be wined and dined, as it were. And then at the end of the presentation of all of the participants' food, he would have been one of those making comments whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. Friends, he enjoyed the best of clothes. He enjoyed the best of cuisine. No doubt this man had many dress appointments and dining appointments. But there was another appointment that he had not planned in his agenda. And it was a death appointment. In verse uh, 20, we read there even that he was so busy with his appointments that he not only passed by but nearly drove over the top of poor Lazarus who was there at his gate desiring the very crumbs that would fall off the man's table but never received one iota of them. Friends, the scripture tells us about that death appointment. You know, it wasn't only for this man to keep, because Lazarus kept it too, and you will keep it, and I will keep it one day. Hebrews 9 and 27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Friends, you know something about this man's exit strategy? It was too little. Too little. Oh, the hymn writer says the following, Have you any room for Jesus he who bore your load of sin, as he knocks and asks the admission sinner, will you let him in? Room for pleasure, room for business, but for what? The Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in your heart for which he died. Prepare to meet your God. We also see in this text Great opportunities. They maybe don't jump out at you from the page. But we can deduce them from the fact that in verse 24, when this rich man had died, how he addresses Abraham. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. 
it reminds us he must have known something of the Old Testament laws. How did he know that Abraham was the father of the nation of Israel? He must have been aware of the covenant. Friends, I tell you more than the covenant. He would have been aware as well of the cross. Because remember in the story of Abraham, how up Mount Moriah he walked there with his little son Isaac. And how there they had the fire and everything prepared for the sacrifice. And we Isaac looked up at his daddy and said, with everything here, but where's the lamb? And Abraham responded to him in chapter 22 of Genesis, God shall provide himself a lamb. And how he done that, there was a sacrificial and a substitutory lamb in Isaac's place. But also the curse. He must have known something of this because later on in verse 28 that we didn't read through to verse 30, he pleads with Abraham that he would send someone, even Lazarus who's dead, to go and appear and to appeal unto his five brethren, lest they come into this place of torment. Friends, this reminds me of wasted opportunities during his life. He recognised that his exit strategy wasn't only too little, but it was too late. You see, in hell, my friends, there will be regrets over wasted opportunities. In hell, there will be remorse over wasted opportunities. And he cried out to Abraham, have mercy upon me, for I am tormented in this flame. I pray that you don't waste your opportunity tonight, but seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him to save you now. Our final point is the guaranteed outcome. You see, there were two things that this man discovered whilst he was in hell. Firstly, we read what he saw. Verse 23, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. Friends, he realised it was a factual place. Maybe like you or others that you have heard joking about the devil, dressed in a red cape, two horns and the pitchfork. Well, he found out to his cost that that was no joke. Friends, that hell was a factual place. The tragedy for him and for you and for anyone else who rejects the Lord Jesus' offer of salvation is that God made hell, yes he did, but Matthew 25 and verse 41 says that it was prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. We call them demons. But yet there's space for others who are Christ rejectors as well. The writer to Hebrews, he would say, How shall ye escape if ye neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2 and verse 3. There is no escape. I tell you, friends, hell is a factual place. Not only a factual place, but it's a final place. So it is. This man pleaded for mercy, even for water to be put on the tip of his tongue. He pleaded for men, for his five brethren, that someone would go and witness to them, that they'd tell them about Jesus and their need to be saved. Friends, this tells me that after you and I close our eyes on this scene of time, after you and I beat our last heartbeat, we go straight into eternity. And how you leave this earth will determine where you will spend eternity. No matter how often people might pray for you, how often people might pay for you, friends, it's already decided and dictated your eternal destiny. But you know, there is good news for you tonight. Because the Lord Jesus gives us an exit strategy. Whenever he says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
That is the exit strategy that we need to follow to get to heaven. Can I ask as I conclude tonight, Abraham tells us, beside all this, between us and you, there is a gulf fixed that neither the twain can go from one to the other. What is your exit strategy for eternity? I hope that it will not be too little, too late, or too lost. May the Lord give you deciding grace tonight, and may you seek the Lord and ask him to save you, and trust in him as your own and personal saviour. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Amen. As we come to the close of our meeting, again I would like to thank Avril for her testimony, you for joining with us, and I pray that the Lord will continue to bless and to look after each and every one of you. We're going to conclude in a moment with our final hymn, that will be number 526, Open My Eyes That I May See. But before that, we just want to pray and ask God's blessing upon you all. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word to our hearts tonight. And if there's someone there at home who has heard the word of God and who as yet knows not Jesus as their own and personal saviour, Lord, may they turn to thee. May they seek thee, Lord, and call upon thee to save them. Lord Jesus, we pray that as we conclude this service of worship here tonight, that you will bless each and every one, not only tonight, but throughout the incoming days of this new week. Thank you, Lord, for your saving grace. Thank you, Lord, for your sustaining grace. Bless and look after us now in Christ our Saviour's name. Amen. Now, we unite our voices together in singing our final hymn of praise, Open My Eyes that I may see.